Go where your best prayers take you, unclench the fists of your spirit and take it easy. Breathe deeply of the glad air and live one day at a time. Know that you're precious and learn to trust. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome to all of you this morning. And thank you for wearing your pink as we commemorate our Pink Sunday. Remember those struggling with cancer, those surviving cancer together as a community. And a great day, all of you here for the baptism, welcome. We're glad you're here this morning. You're our guests. You know, I always like props, and I've done this one other time, but um, I tell you, as active as she is, I don't know if I would tackle it, but I would love to be holding Kennerly Ann right now, because if I had her in my arms, I would have your complete and undivided attention. I would not have her complete and undivided attention at all. She'd be squalling here in a minute. She is the sweet baby daughter of Brittany and Whitfield. It's our pleasure today to bring her for baptism shortly. And if I ask Brittany and Whitfield right now, put them on the spot and ask them, what are you willing to do to provide for her, to make her safe, secure? What would you do to protect her? You both would jump up. And we probably would join them and say, anything, show me where to sign up. I will do anything that it takes. And think of the ways. Right now, I can't imagine your life. I have lived some of it, but you're changing diapers, making sure she is fed and cuddled, adjusting your life to a new baby in the house. How disruptive is that? But before long, think about those of you who are parents or, and have been and acted as parents for others. What next will come? Kindergarten and grade school, those first days of school, and your reading to Kennerly will become reading with Kennerly and helping her with the skills that it takes to navigate the world because that's what will happen. You will release her to the world. As soon as she's in school, she belongs to others as much as you. A painful thing that we're all aware, but what do you have to give her so that she will navigate relationships and gossip and in crowds and out crowds and friendships and sleepovers? It just keeps going, doesn't it? And as she grows, teaching her to be a girly girl. Wish I'd had one of those. A girly girl. You know, how to dress and do your makeup and all that stuff I know nothing about. But all that stuff that you have to do. And then she hits middle school. Oh my gracious. I try to forget those days. Hormones and teenagers driving, waiting up for that call after the first date. All that stuff of navigating the world, navigating relationships. And then high school and it just intensifies because now real world complexities become personal complexities. What we choose and do not choose. What we do and do not do. And the consequences that come from those choices become great. I don't know about you, I'm already tired for them. (laughs) (laughs) And behind it all, you're working. You parents working, saving money, paying a mortgage, trying to help coach young people with problems, trying to separate your problems from their problems, wondering how much your problems are their problems. But then all the monetary stuff, 4013s and, you know, college funds, all the ways that we want to protect and provide for her. You know, if I had 45 minutes, which I won't take, I promise, we're not in a mega church. <laughs> Although I'm waiting. <laughs> just saying, just wait. <laughs> you know, I would spend a lot of time at something that might get under your skin and gets under my skin, which is the conversation of all that we've talked about. We have not yet talked about her spiritual life. I've not even mentioned it. And how invaluable a spiritual life is and can be. 
how it is often spirituality that seems to be so marginalized in our society and so marginalized in the practice of our lives. Sorry, yes it is, mine included. Mine included with my own boys. That it's as almost as if it does not exist. But think about it. When has there been a time, and maybe it's because sometimes when you're older you get it stronger, a time that all that you've accumulated, all that you've earned, all that you have accomplished, all that you have done, all that you have saved will not answer what is in front of you. It won't even begin to help you make sense of the dilemma you are in. And I don't know about you, but I have been there. And when Jesus talks about hell, I understand exactly what he means. You see, it's spirituality and all that it implies, which, again, if I had 45 minutes, we would talk about it. Last week, we had all of our young people at confirmation. I want to remind you, they said, yes, we believe that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Episcopalians do say that. We do mean that. But spirituality also implies then plumbing the depths of what a spiritual life really is. What is it about? And it is so marginal, often we can't even begin to give an answer. And me included. And I kind of do this a lot. (laughs) But I will say one thing. That I know that a spiritual life will protect and provide for Kennerly in ways that we might not see, but are evidenced throughout her life and will be. And it will be as important as every other thing that her parents, Marty and Steve and godparents, grandparents, extended family will do. It is that important. Not only giving life, it can save life. Tom Rasnick introduced me to somebody wonderful, so thank Tom for this person. Because I had known about him, but Tom reintroduced me to him this week. His name is Father Gregory Boyle. He lives in Los Angeles. Catholic priest, Jesuit, came up kind of middle class, upper middle class, went to, went to seminary, kind of ordinary track, decided he wanted to be a missionary, so went to Bolivia. When he got through in Bolivia, his bishop wanted to treat him and kind of have him come back to the United States and serve up a congregation that had some money and had life easy, if you want to know the truth. And he said, no, you know, I don't really want that. I want you to send me to the city. In fact, I want you to send me to the inner city. In fact, I want you to send me to where the inner city is bad. And his bishop did. He assigned him to East L.A., to the Dolores Mission, an old Catholic church there, in the very heart of the gang capital of America and the gang capital of the world. The first year, Father Greg spent time just wandering the streets. He would get on his bike, can you imagine, (laughs) and ride his bike around and just walk around. They thought he was peculiar. And then when they got to know him, they really thought he was peculiar until he started burying their dead. The first year, 20, 30 boys. The second year, a few more. Before three years was up, he had buried 136 young men who had been killed in gang violence. Father G is now known as Father G. He was Greg, and then the gangsters took him on. He became Father G, or here's the best one, G-Dog is what they call him now, because he's the man. (laughs) But he went to his congregation and said, are we going to do something about this, or are we going to quit and fold up shop? Congregation, much like ours in the inner city, said, you know what, we're not folding up shop. So they started Homeboy Industries for the boys to get jobs, counseling. And this is fascinating. They spend a lot of money for the boys to remove tattoos, which is expensive and painful. Because you understand, if they don't take the tattoo off, they don't leave the gang. They're never gone from it. Try this. 
Listen to one of his 10,000, maybe 50,000 interchanges. He's at his office. Willie comes in. Willie's got more tattoos than I have hair. He's got scars. He is rough. He is tough. He's 16 years old. Father G, my stomach has a scale. He means empty. Give me 20. He says back, Willie, get out of here. My wallet is a scale. It is empty. And then he looks at him and he says, okay, get in the car. He says, let's see if the ATM works. They ride down the street. Father G gets out of the car. Willie says, Father G, give me the keys. He says, you're dreaming, Willie, not giving you the keys. He says, the radio. He says, Willie, pray while I'm, while I'm gone. Comes back, hands him the 20. You prayed, didn't you? Yeah, Father G, I did. So then they start driving back. And then Father G becomes a father. Willie, did you really pray? Yeah, Father, I did. He said, what did God say to you? He said, Father G, tell me to shut up and listen. He said, what did you do? He said, I shut up and listened. Driving a little more. Music going. Son, how do you see God? Father G, he's my main dog. That's good, Willie. Willie, let me ask you a more important question. How does God see you? Driving, driving. And then Father G looks over at Willie. Tattooed, mean, street violent, angry. And he's pouring tears like a little boy. He says, Father G, God thinks I am firme. Street language. Firme means could not be one bit better. Father G repeats him. Willie, God thinks you could not be one bit better. I don't need to ask you, do I, where he learned this? He learned it from Father G in that congregation. How did he know that God loves him? Not doing the things he's doing, but as the person he is. Like all of us, needing to make change. Hopefully finding a better way. You see, Father G understands that all children everywhere need a spiritual life. You can give people everything. They won't make it. They won't make it. We have people around us not making it. And we're throwing a lot of money at it. Today in Thessalonians, Paul says something so strong that when our team is reading it, we read the scripture together and talk this last week or two, it just almost overwhelmed me. Paul's talking about trying to give people the depth of the gospel for some deep reason to help them live better lives and saying, you know, this is real. This will really help you. And he ends this passage, and today you read it from J.B. Phillips. That's the translation, this great translator. And he says, Paul says this, we are going to love you in our joy. We're going to love you out of our joy to give you the gospel. And then he ends with, we're going to do it from our very hearts. You may not catch that. Man, it is powerful. In other words, I can write a check, but what is it when I live it in my heart? I can think it and talk it like I am now, but what is it to transport it into my, not only my language, but the very character of my being? What is it when I attach myself to you so deeply that you know I have not only your back, but you have my heart. Like Kennerly knows 
that she has Whitfield and Brittany's heart. That's what it's like. All children need this. All children need this. So now I want to leave you with the pink story. Thank my wife for this. I missed it. She said, you need to watch this story. So here's the story. CBS News some weeks ago. A woman contracted. She didn't know what she had. She was sick, really sick, and having all kind of symptoms. So she went to her hospital, Pinnacle Hospital in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And after about a day and a half of tests, her physician came in to see her with that dreaded news. You have a rare and very serious form of cancer. In fact, this is very serious and it is already running its course. When Tricia Summers heard the news, she was devastated. I mean devastated. She's 45, never been sick, working. She is a single mom. Her son's name is Wesley. Dad took off a long time ago, never be seen again, and she has no family, no one. And now she's been told that she's in the fight of her life. And she said the next person who walked in the door was the nurse. And she looked up and she said, I looked at her and I had this peace that came to me and believe it or not, her name was Tricia too. Nurse Tricia. And she says, I have no idea, but somehow I knew she wasn't a nurse, she was an angel. And I felt this deep comfort and she hadn't even said a word to me. Well, over the next 24 hours, Tricia, the nurse, took care of Tricia, the patient. That's the story until two weeks later. Now, starting chemotherapy, Tricia Summers was back in the hospital. And who comes back in the room? Back on the same ward, same hospital? Tricia Seaman, the nurse. And they sat and talked. And she knew that there was some kind of bond, both of the women. And then Tricia said to the nurse, when you have a minute, would you come down and shut the door? I need to ask you something. I need to talk. She said, yeah, let me do a few things. So she came back. She sat with her. She said, I need to tell you I have terminal cancer. Now they're saying there's nothing that can be done. I'm just going to have to do prophylactic treatment and hang on. And it's gotten much worse in two weeks. And she says, I'm 45, I have no family, and I have an eight-year-old boy. And I want to ask you something. Will you take my son home and raise him? And Tricia, the nurse, said, well, let me think about it. So she went home and talked to her husband, Dan, and to their four children, two boys, two girls. And late spring last year, Tricia Seaman and her son, her husband Dan and their children took in Wesley to live with them. They not only took Wesley in, they also took in Trish, his mother. Otherwise, she would have gone to a nursing home and Wesley would have been farmed out to some kind of care. Tricia, the nurse, was interviewed and asked, why did you do this? You have no obligation to do this. You had barely met this woman. And with this really sweet smile, she said, well, you know, that's what you're supposed to do. More than you are asked to do. We are asked to do more than we're supposed to do. That's what life is like. That's what life is. And when they panned away, she's smiling, and you see a gold cross on a necklace hanging across her nurse's uniform. You see, when we give our hearts, it is life-changing. 
It is life-changing for those who give and those who receive. That's what we do today. We want to change Kenner's, Kennerly's life, starting now, going forward, giving her something that is life-giving, life-changing, something that will be with her now and always. And we pray, God, we will, because we will. Amen.